welcome to Fashion Declares and how to communicate the emergency and lead a conversation and action. Thank you so much for joining us today. So communicating effectively is, is about preparation, but it's also about capturing and moving hearts and minds. And we've got some fantastic panelists with us today that will help us to explore that. I think that one of the things that I've found um, challenging over the years is, is you know, how to stay with the trouble, the discomfort um, and the anxiety of, of doing this work in uh, the social justice, climate and ecological space. And, and one thing that's certainly helped to resource me has been really understanding the why. And I'm, and I'm hoping that today's panellists will really help you in knowing your why. Um, and then there's resourcing yourselves really uh, by, by helping to surround yourself by people with, with, with people with similar values, uh, because sustaining yourself uh, for years um, is, is actually challenging. So we're hoping again that you'll learn some tips. Uh, I know that the speakers will be speaking very much from their hearts about what's helped them uh, to lead the conversation and to lead action. And I think there's a balance to be struck about um, in, in giving some of the bleak facts, but also in engaging people with the positive actions um, so that we're not just speaking to uh, this this echo chamber but we're reaching out and we're inspiring new people new people to 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 build change within the fashion industry so i what i'd love to do now is to um to pass to ben who's going to set uh, the context for the climate and ecological emergency thank you very much safia and great to see so many people in the room today thank you very much for uh, your time so i'm just going to do a quick canter through the context behind i guess my story and why i'm so passionate about this topic and indeed fashion declares i've spent 25 years in the corporate world um, and i quit my job um, last year and I'll maybe touch on more of that later I think the first message I'd like to get across is that we, we're in an emergency and we're, we're way off track addressing it. The graph that you can see here shows the parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere by year. And you can see three things on this graph. N number one, we surpassed the safe levels of CO2 in the atmosphere way back in the mid 1980s. And, and by safe, I mean the human race has never existed in a world with CO2 levels this high. And why does that matter? because CO2 levels are an indication of warming and warming is bad. So that's the first point. The second point I'd like to say is that despite the great efforts, inverted commas of Kyoto, Paris, Glasgow, and anything before and in between, uh, you can see it's made absolutely no difference to the rising of CO2. And the third thing I'd like to say is that this will continue to rise because as you may well have read, 60 of the world's biggest banks have just ploughed nearly $4 trillion, $4 trillion into projects which will finance fossil fuel burning. So, you know, that, that's a pretty stark message. If we just move um, through the next slide and the next one, the effects are, are really clear. Just want to call out a couple of things. Number one, the number of extreme weather events that has happened in the last 20 years, which is 7,000, is double the number that happened in the previous 20 years. And as we know, these are not linear things, so they will only increase exponentially. We also know this phrase, the human climate niche, and the human climate niche is the part of the world where people can actually live. And we know that by, by 2070, if we carry on the way we're going, that one fifth of the world's land where people live will not be habitable because the mean annual temperature is too high. What does that mean? It means that three and a half billion, three and a half billion people will have to adapt, migrate, die, or some other action. This is really difficult stuff. We know that by diversity um, loss, we are in the bottom 10% globally as a country, and that we rely on biodiversity for our food, our medicine, our clothes, you know, all, all of that. And we know that food and water security is under huge threat. You probably read yesterday in the Midwest, in the US, they've got the, the worst drought 
in 1,200 years. You know, these things are happening now. It's not some future event. If we just move through to the next slide. Um, this is all grossly unfair. And if we just, just move on to the next slide, because I think this, this stat says it all. The global south, which is where most people live and only account for a tiny proportion of this climate crisis, bears the bulk of the cost and, of course, the bulk of human suffering and tragedy. Just move on to the next slide. If we carry on as we're going and we move on to the next slide, we know from the scientists and the UK government know from their own advisors that we are heading for extinction in our children's lifetime. A four degree world, a four degree warmed world, which is what the UK government have been told to prepare for by their own committee last year um, or the year before, um, is unsustainable with human life. So all the facts are there. The direction we're heading in is very clear. Um, surely we need to do something about it. So we just move on to, to the next slide and the next one. There is some good news after I thoroughly depressed you. Um, the good news is this, that globally we have all the money we need. We have all the ingenuity. We have all the solutions we need. So the answers are here, right? Staring us in the face because we already know them. The bit that we don't have just yet is the will, either the political will, the business will, or even the personal will to actually make these things happen. We have to act like the truth is real and not just put stuff off any further. If we just move on to the next slide. Project Drawdown, if you're not familiar with it, um, you can download this document for free. They list out the 100 solutions that will address climate change and the top um, 10 you can see in this box here, there isn't time to, to talk through. So these have all been calculated in terms of their benefit, their cost benefit analysis and their CO2 reduction analysis. If we move on to the next slide, at a more, I guess, business level, um, we also know the sorts of things we need to do. And you'll see some of the language here reflected in the five commitments, raising awareness, decarbonisation, supply chain, circular economy, et cetera. These are the things that all businesses need to do. If we move on to, to the next slide. And the thing that keeps me grounded is, is I guess, this, this quote. Um, we don't have the right to ask whether we're going to succeed or not. The only question we have the right to ask is what's the right thing to do? So what is it that the earth requires of us if we want to continue to live on it? And just before I hand back to, to Safia, I've not, not talked about my, my journey particularly, but I, when I had my climate epiphany and I quit my, and in the run up to quitting my role, I did a lot of things internally within an organisation. So I do have a good sense for the people on the call where you're thinking, what is it that I need to do internally in my corporate organization, my personal life to make these changes? Maybe that's some of the things we can talk about later or, or, or offline. Um, that's my uh, slot. Thank you very much for listening. And Safia, hand back to you. Thank you very much, Ben. Um, we've, we'd love to do a deeper dive of, of the social emergency that's unfolding. Uh, and I, who, who better than Ananya Bataji of the um, Asia uh, of the Asia Four Age to to discuss that? Uh, Ananya, could you tell us? Um, and I wonder if Millie, you could pull up Ananya's slides also. Um, Ananya, how how you you've been working as a as a an, an activist for these years? How do you manage to sustain yourself in in terms of? Of, of, of really keeping the intensity of the work that you've got, um, that, you, you, that you, you have going in, in, in as, as the, the situation is becoming you know, all the more um, severe and all the more critical. Well, first of all, thank you for inviting me to speak today. And I applaud Safia, your own uh, commitment and hard work on um, getting this to where it has arrived. Um, well, I sustain myself from seeing all the other people around me who work so hard every day, workers who maintain hope and determination in the face of uh, what, I, what would seem to me like hopelessness. If they can do it, I can do it. And I look at my colleagues who work very hard. I look at my, I have a son. I look at my son and I want him to 
inherit a better planet. All there are many compulsions why I keep going and I think they are not very different from yours. Thank you, Ananya. It's uh, yes, they're not very different to, 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 to mine, but it, it's really it's really helpful to hear you say that. Uh, could you present um, what your activities are and how you see uh, the, the, the why, the, the, the importance of our moving now in, in the context of the climate, ecological and social emergency uh, within the fashion industry? Uh, well, Ben has already laid out the really dire uh, states that we are in. Um, however, I also have this uh, hope that the pandemic has really made a lot of us the, in the planet really understand the urgency of where we are at. And there is more of a commitment to a sustainable life and planet. Um, I, I think there is more of a commitment and understanding that this needs to happen. However, I'm not sure that we all agree on who needs to do what and by when. Um, it's very clear the when is the now. But what needs to happen is not, uh, I think, always apparent. Definitely in the sustainability and the climate action movement, I do see labor as a very big missing part. The emphasis is more, more on materials and circularity and uh, you know, other issues of production and consumption, which are extremely important. However, one needs to understand why fashion exists in the way it exists, which is the model of fast fashion and at a, at a cost that's not sustainable. And why, why is there so much fast fashion and why is the cost so low that people are over consuming? It's because the actual cost of producing these materials are really not paid to the people who are producing them. So, uh, so, the, uh, so, so what I'm trying to do today is to bring labor center stage to the discussion on sustainability and climate action, because it is as important as the, all the other issues that I think this um, audience is more familiar with. Um, the business model that we have today relies on poverty level wages, um, dangerous hazardous working conditions, extremely insecure employment situation, no social protection, and gender-based violence and harassment, along with other deprivations of liberty broadly uh, faced. Now, so what this constitutes a coercive labor environment, and why do you need coercion? Because we need workers to produce very, very fast at a very, very low cost. And the only way you can do that is through very brutal discipline. So this creates a very brutal coercive atmosphere so that the products can be produced the way the brands want them to be produced. Next slide, please. Um, we, uh, uh, Asia Floorbridge Alliance published a report called Money Heist last uh, July, where we, conducted surveys across six countries and almost 500,000 workers from close to 190 supplier factories have experienced $157 million of wage theft. And when I say wage theft, why am I using the word theft? Because these are not living wages that they are being deprived of. These are their legal wages in their country. So they are not even being paid the legal wages. And 74% of these workers were pushed below the World Bank poverty line uh, due to the wage theft. Next slide, please. 
Um, we also saw an escalation of gender-based violence and harassment during the pandemic, where abuse of different forms increased. And we also saw a continuum of violence from the factory to the home. What took place in the factory ended up escalating family domestic violence. And we also saw the violence extending to other living situations that women workers typically have, which is the dorms in the factory, boarding houses that are uh, given to them by their employers um, and so on. So we saw an escalation of violence and also uh, more of a connectivity from workplace to the home, the continuum. Uh, which really made uh, life quite miserable. Next slide, please. This created what we called a garment industrial trauma complex. Uh, this is a garment industrial complex that is fueled by extreme corporate greed and it directly con contributes to embodied trauma of various kinds. We use the word embodied trauma because this trauma is no different from veterans coming back from the war or uh, you know, other sort of large scale uh, uh, disaster, disastrous and violent situations that happen. However, these industries are not supposed to see, be seen through that lens. However, the type of stories we hear from women workers, we are using this term garment industrial trauma complex to show that it's really a complex web of factors which lead to the uh, condition of women workers. Next slide, please. So what is required, and Ben has already said this, is a trans transformative shift. And uh, in this, uh, we, are, we have been proposing for a long time, but we are also finding other business um, writers and leaders thinking the same way now. Living wage can be a strategy, is a strategy to fight climate change for a sustainable planet. Um, you can check up the article that came in Forbes last month or January. Living wage clothing is sustainable clothing. In fact, it might be the greenest clothing we own. Next slide, please. Um, so in this slide, uh, I'm talking about the book Business of Le Less, which you may have heard about where the writer says every dollar spent on labor is an environmentally impact-free dollar. It's a zero carbon dollar. He makes a case for why living wage is a climate change uh, strategy. Uh, other strategies he explains that rely solely on material and process changes risk a rebound effect. They, they may create new environmental problems. Living wage also slows down because if you are paying more, you make better quality and less volume. We need to reimagine economic growth around humans instead of stuff. Um, there is one more slide, but Mili, if you don't have it, I'll talk it through. Um, so what uh, in my last slide, um, what I have is that the way we, uh, talk about it is that in a global supply chain, which is driven by brands, brands must ensure the living wage to workers. And in Asia floor wage, we say that suppliers in Asia pay the legal wage, but living wage, which is more than legal minimum wage, poverty level wage, brands must contribute to the living wage of workers. And we also have started a new campaign this year last year called Joint Employer Liability Litigation Strategy, where we are saying that brands are actually joint employers. When brands say we go to Asia to buy clothes, we are buyers, they are categorizing them themselves wrongly. They are uh, employers who are simply outsourcing manufacturing contracts. Uh, we welcome the EU due diligence mechanisms that are under play. We think that much more rigorous liability oriented accountability has to come into play because this reputational risk type of 
pressure that the brands have been facing for the last couple of decades, they have adjusted to that. So much more stringent measures are required to make sure that the brands act and the fashion industry acts in a way that is sustainable for planet and that is not delinked from the sustainability of human life, which cannot be done without a living wage and decent work. Thank you very much. Ananya, thank you so much. And um, really, really good and clear message as to how the living wage and, uh, and climate action goes hand in hand. And we'd, we'd love in the, the Q&A to also uh, hear more about uh, the, the EU due diligence mechanism and how you see this being a game changer, uh, so a, a piece of legislation that will really hold businesses accountable. Um, I'd like to ask uh, Alden Wickenau to, uh, to, uh, to talk to us about your journey. How, how have you sustained yourself? You know, you're doing so many different things. Um, we'd love to hear about that journey and, um, and, and also some tips and hints uh, uh, to, to, to those participants as to how they can sustain themselves. Over to you, Alden. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Um, yeah, so what a journey it's been over the past few years with the pandemic as well as the worsening climate emergency. Um, you know, I have found a few things that keep me going. One is um, both in my work and also in staying motivated um, in the face of so many um, emergencies that are happening all over the world all the time is showing up every day and trying to do what I can that day. Um, so um, I found personally that if I just think about what I can do that day um, and get into a deep work groove of um, focusing on something small, it ends up adding up and compounding to something much, much, much larger. Um, and so just from a perspective of you know, I look back over the last four years and um, I'm in a much different place than I was four years ago, a much different understanding. Um, my platform has grown and morphed. And um, I think when it comes to the climate emergency, yes, every second counts, but also every second counts in terms of, um, you know, giving yourself, uh, having grace with yourself and, and um, uh, and knowing that you can't solve it all at once, but you can pick away at it and then you look up and you've done a lot. So, um, and also of course, getting out into nature. Um, I got into gardening during the pandemic and seeing the, the cycle of life um, and how time moves in the garden and also um, in nature has been really, really, really helpful in, um, you know, giving perspective um, and also nature is such a balm to the soul and it reminds me what we're working for. So um, that's how I sustain myself. Thank you. Thank you, Alden. Maybe we could have Alden's slides up. So um, yeah, this is stuff, just some um, examples of my work through the years and I hope nobody tries to um, read this because this isn't a presentation. This is just an example. Um, and of course, this is all online. You can Google it. Um, if anybody can't get through the paywall for uh, this one, Conscious Consumerism, um, feel free to ping me on LinkedIn. Um, I can PDF it and send it to you. Um, the paywall is new. But so this is um, actually represent. So I founded Eco Cult in 2013. Um, and in 2013, um, sustainable fashion was not talked about the way it is now. Um, very, very, very few people would even allow me to write about it. I think my first article on the topic um, was for uh, Refinery29. Um, God bless my editor there, um, Connie. And, um, but nobody was really talking about it. And then when people did start talking about it, it was, um, there were two fallacies that I saw. One was that just wrong information, um, misinformation that was coming out. And then the other thing was that um, 
it could all be solved simply by shopping. Um, so if you care about the climate, then, um, you know, uh, every purchase you make is a vote for the world you want to see. Um, I believe that voting is a vote for the world that you want to see. And I started to have, um, I was starting to have doubts. And so I ended up writing this for um, courts and um, it went viral because I think it tapped into some feelings that were coming up for a lot of people of, you know, I'm spending all this money. I don't know where the money is going exactly. Um, you know, I want to, I care deeply about garment workers, but, you know, I'm not sure if I'm spending more, how much of that is actually making it to the garment worker. Um, you know, I'm not seeing, I'm not, I'm not sure if I'm spending more for organic cotton, if it's making it to the organic cotton farmer. Um, and there was a lot of, and still is a lot of greenwashing going on um, there, you know, with, there are some exceptions, of course, like people tree has always been very clear as sort of the OG in this area of, of showing impact. But um, I, so this went viral and it, it basically said like, look, you know, everybody knows that water bottles are bad for the planet, but, and yet water bottle consumption is going up. Like, what are we doing here? Um, you can move to the next slide. Um, so also there was this problem of misinformation. Um, you know, fashion was supposed to be the second most polluting industry after oil. Um, and I could never find information for this fact. So I started working on um, sort of actually fact-checking some of these things, trying to figure out where are they coming from, um, digging into um, talking to um, uh, people who try and find the researchers, which unfortunately are very scant in the um, fashion world. Uh, you know, there's not a lot of research being done and sort of created a feedback loop of, you know, there's not enough research um, being done. So researchers can't get funding because they're trying, like when you do a proposal, you have to cite information that you're building on and there's not much information to build on. So they're getting pushed back from their advisors saying, like, is this a topic? Like, this doesn't seem serious. Um, so uh, I moved into trying to find the people who are doing the primary research. Um, and that's brought me some amazing places. Um, I traveled around the world in 2018 and um, I made a point to go to Bangladesh because, um, and India because, and you know, Central America and Peru and all these places because I was tired of talking about people that I hadn't met. Um, I wanted to complicate my narrative. I wanted to, to bring nuance to the conversation instead of making it just black and white. Um, and that's one of the um, important things that I, I wanted to talk about today, which is go to the people who are on the ground. Um, a lot of times they're not obvious. They're not, you know, you can't just like Google sustainable fashion advocate and find these people. They're doing the work um, and they're so happy to talk to you and tell you, um, you know, what solutions they see, like what they're working on so that you can raise awareness of, of what they're doing. Um, if you could go to the next slide, please. Um, so more information about, you know, misinformation. Um, this um, is still being cited and um, worked on. And I get a lot of questions from people saying like, okay, like I get it. You know, a lot of this information isn't true, but like, where is the good information? And again, I would go back to find the researchers. Um, it's kind of hard to find them, but they are there. Um, and this is something that keeps me going which is um, I feel so revitalized, um, not when I'm sort of scrolling on social media and absorbing like whatever is going on there, but when I'm in conversation with people who are doing the work. So for example, um, you know, when I'm talking to, um, I just realized that there's a researcher at Duke, Heather Stapleton, who's been working on um, uh, doing primary research along with some of her students um, and colleagues on um, azo dyes and um, azo dyes that uh, we actually don't know the chemistry of until now, until their work um, and how they are affecting our health. And this is something that, you know, you don't see come up in mass media, but they're there and they're doing the work and they're so delighted when somebody can amplify that um, and, uh, you know, um, share that work with people. Um, and, um, 
Okay, so you can go to the next slide. Um, so what I've realized is, you know, this this um, article for Wired, uh, my editor just said, hey, we want to write about climate and fashion, which is a huge thing. And I could have gone back to like, climate is responsible for this much and blah, 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 blah. But I wanted to focus on solutions. And so I started talking to people and I said, we, you know, what, what's missing here? Like, what, what are we not doing? Like, what could comp brands do if they really wanted to? And out of that came um, a new narrative, which is what brands need to do is they need to commit to factories who are doing the work um, and um, pay them appropriately for the extra investments that they are making in climate, uh, you know, emissions reductions. And there's, I was looking for brands that are doing that. And I didn't find many brands that are doing that. And that is I've already starting to change. Like we're seeing, um, I hate to hold up Walmart, but after this article came out, Walmart did say that they were taking out bonds in order to be able to fund um, climate, uh, climate positive uh, developments and investments at the factories that they work with on a long-term basis. And um, Ghani is also saying that they're going to start doing something called climate insetting, which is investing in um, emissions reductions within their supply chain instead of offsetting, which is like, you know, planting trees. Um, so this is um, where I'm going with my work is looking for solutions instead of just sort of doomsday propositions, um, which can, you know, feel really demotivating but when you're looking at solutions that's where um that's where we can get people involved um and you can go to the next slide please okay so this is my latest um piece and um this one uh somebody came to me because they were very frustrated with a lot of the uh greenwashing going on um in the organic cotton industry and I will say that this article is a lot shorter than I would have liked because it was in a physical newspaper. Um, but basically, this is something where um, I couldn't put solutions in because it was shorter, but I was calling out a problem because, um, you know, uh, I have learned to question everything. And um, one of the things that was bothering me was, um, you know, just saying like organic, like go with organic certified cotton and um, hearing that there were some problems in there and trying to find out what exactly was going on. And um, I can't really get into the full scope here, but essentially it goes back to a, um, to the farmers and to the people like uh, Ananya said, um, it's not about the certification. It's about whether or not organic cotton farmers are getting the support they need directly and in order to grow organically, whether they're getting the training, whether they're getting the inputs, whether they're getting the premium so that they continue to do this. So it's not just about paying more for your, uh, your, your organic certified organic clothing. It's about um, supporting the work and brands um, doing more to connect directly with farmers and supporting what they do. So again, it goes back to um, the people. And so um, I'm not sure where I am in terms of my time. Um, I, I think, yeah, you're, you're on time. So um, okay, great. thank you so much. Uh, I think Alden, that gives us a a great segue into um, to Debbie, um, the importance of those long-term relationships with suppliers to pay a living wage and also to support farmers who are after all the stewards of the land. You know, if we're looking at uh, carbon sequestration, we, we can't do that unless we are looking uh, after the farmer's interest. So thank you so much for, um, for, for giving us that, that overview and um, illustrating your amazing work. Um, uh, Debbie, could I ask you to um, to introduce what what you're doing to sustain yourself, but also to um, to come uh, to? I know that you've prepared some brilliant ideas and signposting for people within the industry to to start that journey of of leadership and action. Um, can I ask uh, you to present? 
Absolutely. Thanks, Safia. Great to be with you all today. And thank you for making your time um, val valuable time. Um, yeah, so I think how I sustain myself really is, it's just like that sort of moment, that quite despairing moment when Ben quite rightly and quite importantly reminds us of, of why we need to act. Um, it can be, I think, quite demotivating, as Alden said. I think it's really important to remind ourselves, but not to get you know to that sort of bleak spot it sort of paints a picture of a very horrendous industry of a very toxic um negative industry and actually from my experience the people that i have met and the people that i've had the the, the huge um sort of luck and opportunity to meet through my time in the fashion industry are not sort of toxic negative people so that gives me hope that gives me joy um, I've had an amazing opportunities in this industry to meet incredible people uh, across the value chain, to be in touch with nature, to travel. And I've got two daughters. I want them to have the same opportunities. I want them to have uh, a better world, in fact, than the world that I'm living in. So that gives me hope that that sustains me every day. Um, shall I, yeah, if you could pop up my slide, Millie, I'll, um, I was going to dig into just a little bit more um, detail on sort of how really I got into the conversation, how I entered the fashion industry, and then I want to move on to some real practical, useful top tips on how to communicate the emergency and lead a conversation. Um, so kicking off then uh, with a background to myself, um, I started um, at Kingston University studying fashion design. I was quite geeky, a back, back one, we're not quite there yet, Millie. Um, I started off real quite geeky about textiles, interested in wool, uh, knitting, repurposing of fabrics, uh, bio textiles, and I, I absolutely loved university and it was a real kind of creative springboard to jump into the world of fashion. Um, which was a, a, a bit of a wake up call. I entered um, fast fashion uh, in London, working for numerous brands, and it was a surprise to me that my tech pack that I filled in um, pre-internet, this was a piece of paper, uh, had no composition field. It had a reference number of where I needed to put my fabric. Didn't tell me what it was made of. It was prescribed to me. I was asking more about the fabric. I loved textiles. I wanted to know. I wanted to have ideas around what different textiles to use. There wasn't time to do this, I was told. Um, I wanted to engage with the supply chain. I wanted to visit suppliers to learn more. Um, again, very little time, but also we just kept swapping suppliers, I found, continually swapping. There was no continuity. Um, there was never time to fit garments, to spend time to sort of rework anything. It was, it was sort of a constant machine. Um, with 24 collections a year, this is unsurprising. So really time was kind of the barrier. Um, so sort of long story short, after eight years in sort of high street fast fashion, I became quite disillusioned, um, dropped out and went traveling. Um, I joined a circus, in fact, um, traveled through Brazil and then ended up in Peru. Uh, next slide, please, Millie. Um, here's some slides from uh, my time in Peru. I began working with a knit cooperative on the outskirts of Lima, working with very talented women in poor communities to help provide an income. Um, I got involved in an organic cotton farm up the coast to understand more about indigenous alternatives to the use of pesticides. Um, and had the opportunity to explore plant dyes, plant natural dyes. Um, had a small dalliance with my own brand, with some of my most creative and best friends. Um, and in many ways, this period of my life was sort of my university, my learning, um, learning from people, learning from nature, my aha moment, if you like. And this was, you know, a real privilege, which I'm very grateful for. Um, but what I don't want to do is say, get out of fashion if you're in it, you know, go and go and do this, go globetrotting, give up. Actually, I wish I'd stayed in many ways and, um, you know, and, and, and fought from within. Um, but next slide, please. Um, 
So I came back from Peru and I ended up landing an opportunity to work in Cornwall with the very micro Finisterre team back in 2008, picture there on the left of us at the beginning. Um, incredible bunch of like-minded um, surfers actually uh, with strong values, a real meeting of minds and this incredible opportunity to learn from suppliers, learn from growers, um, to slow down, to actually have the time to learn and understand, to ask questions, which is so important, um, and to set goals and, and challenges together. Uh, I think that's just so, inv so invaluable. If you just keep moving suppliers, they don't know what you want. They're never going to be able to you know, work with you to achieve these goals. Um, in 2018, um, at Finisterre, we certified as a B Corp. Um, it was a huge learning curve and an opportunity for me to understand more about how business can be a force for good. There was a lot of challenges during the time at Finisterre, um, but you know we, 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 made, we made mistakes and we learned very quickly, um, but the, a, a brilliant opportunity. Uh, at the end of last year, I decided to take a break from the brand and to take the experiences um, and this sort of sense of urgency that I felt into the wider fashion, fashion industry, which brings me bang up to date. Um, next slide, please, Millie. Um, yeah, so as I said, I encourage you to, to create your own story. That was mine. Don't drop out of fashion. Be brave, you know, be the change from within your industry. Um, and I just wanted to give you some real kind of practical tips on you know, it's quite daunting. I think it's pretty daunting when you hear what Ben is talking to there and how to actually sort of face up to the realities and do something about it as opposed to putting your head in the sand. So my top tip to begin with is to get relevant. Yeah, what are the global challenges that are facing your brand, your organisation? Yeah, we, it might not be specific to your, to, your, um, to your exact company, but it's bound to be specific to the fashion industry. Climate change, global, uh, greenhouse gas emissions, plastics, microfibers, water, limitations to water resources. What are the top priorities within your organisation? Get really into the, sort of the narrative of what those key impacts are. Um, you might not know what to do about them, but understand, zoom in, what are those issues? Uh, look at social media for your organisation. What are the potential weaknesses that are being exposed by your customers? What questions are they asking? What are they demanding more of from that brand, from your brand, from your organisation? And who else is doing it well in your competitor space? Um, what are the risks of inaction? Yeah, so we know what the risks are from an environmental point of view or from a social point of view, but actually turn that to your advantage. Yeah, so if the brand is likely to, to be exposed as brand reputation from inaction or operational supply risks to your brand because of not reacting and not uh, moving towards positive impacts, these are going to be very interesting to the leaders of your organisation. Yeah, so, so get relevant is my first tip. Uh, second, uh, secondly, next slide, please, Millie, um, is to get savvy. Yeah, so get informed. Yeah, what are those challenges that are facing your value chain and your territories? You know, what, whether it's, again, limited water resources or human rights, what are the biggest impacts environmentally, uh, socially and biodiversity? What are those impacts um, on where you are making it within your organisation and where you're sourcing from? Um, is there anything in the public domain that you can look at from your organisation? Look at impact reports. Are there any compliance audits? Pour through that information, really get to understand it and, and to be able to sort of question and to challenge that information. Um, a real warning point here in terms of getting information. Beware of looking at brand information. Um, it, it is a real pitfall that it could be greenwashing. Look at third party verifiable information. Um, we're going to share some links um, in the chat and on the Fashion Declares website of where you can go for information, those, those verifiable third party resources. This is a good time to be alive here, guys. There's a huge amount of information, podcasts, webinars. It's, it's out there. It's in the public domain. So get informed. Um, 
one, one thing I just wanted to just make a little sort of warning around um, Ben's talking about the impact of, 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 of climate change, but also the impact of the fashion industry is often talked about whether it's the first, second, third biggest pollutant. Actually, the truth is we don't know. The, the real impact of the fashion industry is, is opaque. It is a, a huge beast. It is made of very complex, intertwined, um, multi-tiered supply chain. So we actually don't know the true impact. It's probably worse than we think. Yeah, so unravel, join the dots, ask questions, poke at the data. Um, if all else fails, my suggestion is make, uh, make friends with finance and accounts, follow the money. Yeah, and you will get a sense of the true impact of the organization you work for. Uh, next uh, slide, please. All my tips say number one, I've just noticed, apologies. Um, so we're nearly there. So the next one is to get together. Yeah, be inclusive, make friends for, with everybody in your organization and outside of your organization. Be pre-competitive. Yeah, this is about sharing knowledge and advocating for change lead uh, the knowledge that you've learned and, and make those alliances within your company. Uh, last slide, please. Um, yeah, just a reminder, last slide here. So a reminder that if you work in the fashion industry, you have power. The fashion industry accounts for 2% of global GDP and the industry employs 60 million people worldwide. Harness this power, help leadership to see that your vision for a positive regenerative fashion system is, is possible and it's the only way. Less bad is no longer an option. We need to move to positive impact. And the current fish, fashion industry is broken. Yeah, it's dead end. It's time to invest in the future and importantly, help them to see that it makes both moral and economic sense to do so. Um, and just be, be positive, yeah, be positive, be persuasive. Despair doesn't lead to action. Um, but yeah, ultimately good luck and don't delay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Debbie. That was really so informative and, and so galvanizing. The, um, the links will be, will be put in the, the chat box and um, they are um, under uh, the, the, the tool number one on the, uh, the Fashion Declares website under resources, but we'll, we'll put them here for you and we'll also send them to you uh, after um, the webinar. Um, I think it, it, fantastic illustrations there from uh, from all of our speakers um, there there are the resources that uh, Ben presented to Ben's presentation is available on the fashion declares website so if you want to download it uh, there's also uh, the recording of Ben um, so if you wanted to deliver that in your organization or to your club or peers uh, there it is um, those wonderful resources that were shared also uh, by Alden by and Anya and by Debbie are, are, are available. So I think we've we've learnt and we understand now better the link between living wages and finding that transition, uh, that transition to, uh, to to the solutions that we need, uh, which which are so urgent um, that link the climate, ecological, and those social issues. And, and I'm deeply grateful for that. Um, that we need to engage, we need to research, we need to really um, uh, understand the issues, not believe them at face value. And Alden is, is, is one of the most well-researched journalists that I know in this space, and I really admire that. So really kind of cutting through it. We've also seen the launch of uh, greenwash.com last week, um, which, which also shows that uh, fashion businesses won't be able to get away with the kind of... Um, uh, non-fact uh, backed uh, independently verified um, claims that they have been making um, if you could please um, I'm so sorry I, I, there, there's time for a few questions if you could please uh, pop your questions into the chat box um, again please do um, join Fashion Declares if you've not signed up already we have over 420 people that have joined Fashion Declares and signed up to the five commitments. Uh, we will be running webinars um, uh, every couple of weeks. Welcome to Fashion Declares and also expert panels on decarbonisation, low impact materials, social justice and equality, uh, right through to transparency and governance. So please do 
uh, join us uh, by signing up and we'll make sure that you're informed and you get um, the opportunities to, to join the webinars. Um, I would, whilst we've got um, some questions coming into the chat box, I'd very much like to hear um, if we could, Ananya, could you please um, spend a minute for us uh, explaining why you feel so positively about the EU due diligence uh, piece and, and how you feel that that might change the game? Um. Well, right now, uh, the, the EU directive, uh, the European Commission has uh, given a proposal for a directive in which they have gone far, uh, definitely more is needed. Uh, there is basically activity in the European Union to pass due diligence mechanisms which have liability as a, uh, as a way of accountability of brands. This is very, very important. Uh, it, it should be more comprehensive and all of that, we can talk about that, but the angle of the liability is extremely important in the brand home countries, just as we are also fi uh, fighting for joint employer liability in the production countries. The New York bill, unfortunately, does not go far and needs, which is a proposed bill, and needs to be amended for greater accountability. So in your view, this is the piece of, uh, this mechanism could be the, the, the strongest piece to hold brands accountable and to create those mandatory agreements and legislation, Ananya? Um, Yes, basically we need legislation in both sides, in the brand side, in the, in the uh, you know, retail side, as well as in the consumer side, as well as on the production side. Now in Asia, we are not creating new legislation. We believe we have existing legislation which needs to be used, which people have never thought of using in order to claim that brands are jointly liable. In the EU, there is new legislation being proposed. So both new and existing on both sides because the global supply chain has a Northern side, which is the consumption side and a Southern side, which is the production side. Both sides need to have liability as the form of accountability because anything softer is just not happening right now. Thank you, thanks for that clarification. It, it always shocked me 30 years ago uh, visiting uh, partners in, in, in the production countries and realizing that international laws were totally ignored uh, by brands and that that was commonplace. Um, thank you for that clarification, Ananya. Um, so uh, I see in the chat box, um, there's also discussion about um, how we're going to promote networks between industry and academia. Um, there's a small working group within Fashion Declares um, that are meeting to look at uh, best practice within um, sustainable uh, fashion uh, undergrad and postgrad courses. Um, so we'll be putting a, an article up. Um, we'll also be looking at how that, um, that learning um, and that uh, link with industry uh, can be um, strengthened. So thank you very much for that, that question. Great, well, I'd, um, we'd, we're just here at the two o'clock, um, nearly the two o'clock mark. So if I could just open up for one comment from each of our speakers, um, if I could ask uh, Alden to, to uh, start with a one minute, please, or 30 seconds. Um. Yeah, I'm so I'm so sorry. Uh, on what particular topic would you like me to uh, end sorry. on? <laughs> I beg your pardon. Thirty seconds. What can we do to lead yeah. and communicate the the emergency? Yeah, absolutely. I think you know what. In the end, sustainable fashion is local. So start with your country, your community, um, your your particular you know, wheelhouse of what you're working on instead of trying to 
bite off the entire global industry. Um, it's great to talk to your community about this, to um, go to local swaps, do all of those things, um, and it can help keep you motivated. Thank you so much, Alden. Debbie? Yeah, um, try try to find out something new every day to enrich your understanding. Read something, watch something, listen to something, however you engage with the universe. It's all out there. Just Thank every day, try and enrich yourself. Ben, could you go next? And I'll unmute Ananya. Sorry. Yeah, I think my mine would be um, be brave uh, to speak out. You'll be amazed at how many people wanted to speak out and join your conversation but weren't able to because they were scared so be brave and speak out and know that you are on the right side of history by doing so thank you thank you Ananya yes I would echo what Ben said uh, you are on the right side of history and I think it's really important for us to remember that the most precious thing for us is the planet and the living beings on it. And that we need to sustain our planet and make sure that human beings live in dignity. Thank you. Well, thank you so much to all of our speakers for today and, and everyone who's, who's joined. Uh, please do stay engaged with Fashion Declares. Uh, we'll be mailing you uh, a link to this uh, webinar if you'd like to share it with friends. Uh, and there'll also be a link to resources. Please uh, use Fashion Declares as a network, as a community to resource yourself and to keep uh, supported and inspired and, and making the change that you do. Thank you so much today to everyone. Thank you. Bye bye. <laughs>